sometimes as chairman, sometimes as a member, sometimes as president, he has been actually involved in all kinds of things. Uh, in Astro, in American College of Archaeology, uh, Texas Radiological Society. This is San Antonio, where we go live, uh, who used to, yeah, I still live there, but uh, this is his book. The CTRC is uh, the one we were most of the time, that is part of A.P. Anderson, everything changes. This is the first satellite that he brought to, to Texas, and uh, there were no other one at that time, of course, I mean, more now, this is the this time. This is the last one in Austin, where he has been working at the Grizzly. He has been a member of the Board of Chancellors, in the past president, the new president. And traditional colony has been his life. He eventually finished uh, with 35 members in the CTRC, starting with a uh, small community of $600,000, going to $12 million. He couldn't keep it down with Jim. Jim Berry was the, the, pers the person that makes things happen. This is the old CTRC. We have a, a long corridor with a bunch of eight or ten machines. We thought it was the longest in the world, probably not. Uh, patents and publications, he has many of them. 51 publications for somebody who has been involved in clinical physics. It is very impressive. Things we have done together, just to by some of the traditional colleagues who have about this side application, which is a very complicated thing. He's a person that likes fun. <laughs> <laughs> which is very, very big, I don't know if you've ever seen many of them. So the he has been a brilliant, has had a brilliant career of innovation, teaching and service, and I'm very happy indeed that he has become the recipient of the 2023 World Medal for the TRS. Uh, Dr. Dutton said, uh, 
Jim, uh, we're getting the only dedicated mammography unit in the world here. And I want you to make sure that it works really well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was a, a Siemens mammogram. I don't know if you know what that machine was. But it uh, was a, one of the first to use a living target at the time. And, uh, but uh, at that time, we were heavily involved with zero radiography and application of mammography, zero mammography. And uh, the German service guy put a machine together for us at, at the department. Said, uh, Jim, why don't you try the Xerox plate up, bring it in. I think I can make x-rays now with the unit. And let's see what we see. And uh, so I charged the plate up, put it in there, and we thought we'd just see the color here from the edges of the field, right? Except there was this big thing in the middle of the image which had things that looked like calcium deposits. And I said, there's no breast in this image. So what is happening here? And he said, oh, don't worry about it, Jim. Well, I'll get it fixed. After many tries, he couldn't fix it. Uh, do you want to hear the rest of the story? I <laughs> <laughs> uh, the upshot of it was that uh, when I looked closely at the uh, image of that stuff, whatever it was, uh, it looked like images of the focal spot of the x-ray tubes, which was something that the physicists trying to uh, ascertain what the size of that is. So I asked the service guy, what is the nominal size of the focal spot of the machine? And he told me. And I looked at it and I said, looks like it's a lot bigger than that on the images. So uh, uh, I went back home and thought about it and thought about it. And I said, you know, that looks like a focal spot. Uh, pinhole camera image of it. And uh, so uh, I want to sort of orient you, and I know many of you uh, have passed your physics boards uh, and that kind of thing. But uh, when I went home, I said, now where would a pinhole camera type uh, entity be in the train from the focal spot to the Xerox plate? And it was right where the filter was, the aluminum filter, because we could, because you know we filtered out a lot of the low energy X-rays, so that didn't contribute to the images. It wouldn't get through the breast. Uh, but uh, the problem was that the filter was completely in place in plastic, and uh, I, I talked to a couple of the other physicists. And I said we need to take that apart. <laughs> he said, well, you know, this is the only mammography dedicated machine in the world. And I said, if you take that apart and something happens, God's going to kill you. <laughs> I said, well, that's the only place it can be. And indeed, uh, we decided to go ahead and take the plastic off. And what was inside was a piece of aluminum. But a German machinist left some iron filings on that aluminum plate, just in that position, really small, you know, shavings, even smaller than that, smaller than grains of rice and stuff. And so what it looked like was that um, this was a image in many areas of the focal spot of the X-ray tube. So fascinated by that, uh, and it resulted in our first patent when I was in the department there, called imaging by the point absorption of radiation. Why did this happen? Because we weren't using regular X-ray film; we were using radio, uh, zero radiography. And what zero radiography does is it's insensitive to broad areas of targets in the image. 
when you get down to specs like uh, specs uh, calcium deposits in the breast, for example, I was very good at that. We used it a long time in mammography until we were forced to uh, abandon it because the drugs stopped making them. But then, yeah, that resulted in our first patent, which was really exciting for a new guy coming into the <laughs> department. And, and, and in fact, God was very impressed with me. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, uh, tell you about a different juncture in my career, and that is getting into the area of uh, uh, medical economics, especially uh, radiology economics. And uh, at one point in time in my career, I was on the economics committee of the ACR, the TRS, the AAPM, and ASTRA. And at this time, uh, the Cancer Deadly Research Center, Dr. Mary could tell you a little more about that, uh, we were one of the first uh, clinics in radiation therapy to get IMRT, which is Intensity Modulated Radiotherapy. It was a very complicated way to treat uh, cancer tumors at the time, uh, but uh, it took uh, much more effort on both planning, uh, dealing with the patient, because one had to be extremely accurate in the placement of the beams from the IRT system. And uh, knowing that that was how we were going to do things, uh, we were only getting paid uh, by Medicare, anyhow, for uh, the regular radi radiation therapy totals. Astro asked me if I would go with them and make a presentation to the RUC, which is probably one of the most uh, uh, strange group of people. <laughs> so there are 25 stalwarts of all medical societies that make decisions about reimbursement. And the first thing they will say to you when you present a new thing to them is no. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for it is that uh, if they increase, uh, it's like a water balloon, increase it in one uh, society and practice, we have to decrease in other society. So, uh, uh, but uh, the fortunate thing is they, they chose the right guy like me. <laughs> I, I found myself to be trying to explain to all these different, very specialties. Uh, I felt myself like being Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, it worked out. Now, it didn't work out just right away. They said no first. But we, on them, and usually they one day they say no, you go home and that's it. This time they wanted to meet with us personally for two days after that to explain to them really in, in depth on, on uh, what this entailed and why it was worth more reimbursement than the regular radiation therapy modalities. Well, they finally relented. But the administrator uh, of CMS at the time, uh, Paul Rudolph, called me back in San Antonio at the Cancer Center and said, Jim, I know that you guys made a great presentation and that we're gonna probably do this, but I need to see this in action. Is there a place that's doing this uh, in the DC area? Fortunately, we had just trained a physicist at the Naval Hospital uh, in uh, DC. And uh, I asked him if he would entertain Paul Rudolph for a day, show him what he does with Harry Martin. He said, sure. Paul called me the next day and he said, you are absolutely right, Jim. That's a lot of work. <laughs> 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 so that's uh, two of my sort of successes that I really uh, say is really some of the highlights of my career. The one thing I want to tell you, though, is that for all of the, for all of the uh, work that went into uh, defending uh, radiology and radiation oncology, uh, the 
the time it took and the effort, as, as Zeke still knows, takes a hell of a lot of time. And uh, unfortunately, uh, several of my employers decided that I shouldn't be involved in the society. And so they said, either you relinquish those and stay working for us uh, with all your time, uh, or we're going to have to let you go. And I said, well, uh, I can't. I mean, I was on the board of chancellors at the time for the ACR. And, uh, you know, it was one of my dreams as a physicist. And uh, uh, so it happened. And I think Zeke can tell you that uh, that's one of the problems with us working in economics so heavily that we do have the support of societies, but it's the groups that employ us that don't have the appreciation that a small percentage in increased reimbursement works all throughout, you know, it floats all boats, I think is what I would say. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think we need to rethink uh, not only the society support, but the group support of the individuals that are doing this work. Here is, here is. So, here is.